Hey folks, so this video is going to be a direct follow-up to the last video. If you haven't seen that, you need to go back and watch that or none of this is going to make any amount of sense. All right, uh, so this whole Intermediate Python series is basically me just trying to present uh, practical applications for things while trying to explain some good intermediate concepts in Python that I know I didn't necessarily learn from all the, the introductory stuff. Uh, so like I, I snuck in explaining the uh, uh, list comprehensions and, and use them in a practical way. Um, and in this video, we're going to build on what we've got here by seriously thinking about our security vulnerabilities and addressing those and continuing to hopefully have some fun with this because uh, I find it really interesting to think about uh, this from the attacker's perspective. Like what, what can I decipher as the attacker to try to get through the security? So let's uh, continue with what we've got right now where we're sending this challenge here that uh, is providing the, what we're calling the API key. That's the actual password that we've been hashing with a scrambled up bunch of text and um, the password and a timestamp. And the scrambled up bunch of text that we're using here, which was actually a, a salt to this password, is the, the technical term for it, is this whole big string here that's randomly generated to be the length of whatever my IP is when you take all the numbers in my IP and sum them together. Um, and then we add the hour to the end of that. <laughs> And we try to make it look like it's a base 64 thing by adding in equal signs at the, the back of that. So, all right, that, that's kind of amusing. The real security is happening here, but there are a couple of points in this that are actually a case of us being too clever for our own good. Um, so if I'm an attacker and I keep on trying to hit this thing, trying to figure out what's going on with it, and it keeps on giving me a, a specific number at the end of that, I'm gonna figure out what that number is really fast. Like, I'm gonna figure out that this 20 here in this case is UTC uh, the hour. Like, it's not gonna be hard for an attacker to figure it out if you keep on giving them the same number at the end of the thing. So that's that was a bad idea. We should never do that. Uh, but it is something I've seen a lot of people do, so that's why I've included it in the first video. Um, the second part of this is another thing that uh, is gonna be kind of a dead giveaway. This timestamp, and then we do this timestamp thing here. Man, I have, I've had to deal with some really shoddy APIs, and in all of my career, I've only seen one that gave time as a timestamp like this. Like this is just not something that you would ordinarily see. And if I was an attacker and I saw that, I think that that was a clue. <laughs> like, so I'd know that that was definitely part of this password hash uh, that, that I would, you know, just be able to use. So let's. Let's clean this all up and make it look uh, a little bit more obfuscated. Uh, so let's get rid of this hour thing altogether. That was just a silly idea. And for our jumble of stuff. Oh yeah, uh, another thing here. Uh, I'm using these characters that we're using to uh, randomly select from. I, I put the string dot assy lowercase and uppercase together. I could have just gotten the same result by just doing string uh, assy letters and it'll give me the upper and lower case. So instead of just having a whole big jumble of stuff that's equal to our sum, let's make it a really, really big jumble of stuff and have the, the important bit hidden somewhere in the middle of all that. So how do we do that? How do we make a big jumble of things and then have a very specific region that we're interested in. Remember that we're limited to the information that we know as the server and the information that the client knows so that mathematically the client can figure out where it needs to be looking in the big jumble of nonsense to find the salt or the scramble. So another thing that like we're using our IP as an example uh, here, we can also use their IP to uh, have a a specific, like this is a number that you know and you should you be able to use it if you're decoding this. So let's uh, take the last number in their IP. So we'll do a IP sum two, and this is gonna be equal to uh, IP sum plus, and here I'm gonna get the last number of their IP, which uh, we can easily get by doing a self WebSocket uh, remote address. And this is a tuple, I want the first instance of that. And now I could do an, another one of these uh, list comprehension things, but it's, let me show you another <laughs> easy way to get the same exact result here. This is giving us an IP address. We can do a split on this and now it's split up the numbers into a new list. So we don't have to actually do a list comprehension here at all. We just pick the last item of that list 
and we need to remember to turn that into an integer so that we can now add that to whatever this adds up to. And now we've got a really big uh, thing, but let's, let's make our scramble even bigger than that. So we'll take whatever IP sum two equals, and then we'll multiply that by two. And now it's going to create a, a gigantic scramble. Now, um, let me uh, show you. I've got a few things uh, prepared here to kind of show you off my next trick. Um, so this is a really big scramble. It is really big. Okay. And if I want to pick specific portions in that, there's ways to do that using um, slices. So you know how we can do things like uh, say, I want the first thing of an item or I want the last thing of an item using different slices on lists. And we can do the same thing with uh, strings where we can say, uh, give me the first item of this scramble and it's gonna give us that O. And we can do, you know, give me the last one and it's gonna give us a D. We can also do multiple arguments in these slices. So I can say, uh, give me starting at the fifth item in this, give me the next five, so up to the tenth item. And you'll see that T N Q J H fit into that. Let me reprint that scramble. So now we can really, you know, just dive way into this now because this is a huge scramble. We can go like, well, it's the 150th thing and then uh, give me that, uh, whoops, scramble. What's the 150th to the 250th thing? And you know, now we got this whole big thing. And we can get even cleverer. <laughs> Uh, there's a third argument that you can give, which is uh, steps. So uh, it's actually way, way easier if I uh, do this like that there. So I, I'm telling it to skip every other one when I give it a two. Like It's basically always defaulting to one, but if I give it two, it's now going to skip every other thing here. So now it skipped that R and it skipped that R and it's, it's doing that. We can also go backwards. But we can't from here, like if we do negative one is the way you go backwards. But if you do that right here, what you're actually telling it is start at the back and then give me whatever is in this range. But this range isn't necessarily going to be there. Like you know, that's nothing there. Uh, so the way that we do this to take what we've got here. So remember, we got we got this in this range of so 100 characters from there. We do another slice on that and we do two colons without putting anything in them. And then we say negative one here, and now it gives us that in reverse. So let's let's do that. Let's use the numbers that we have that we know that the client is going to have to formulate a challenge based on that. And in this case, challenge and scramble are kind of confused here. Let me get rid of this. Um, let's call this the challenge. And um, we want a salt from that challenge. And that salt is going to be doing these this slice thing that I'm talking about, where we start at whatever the IP sum is when you add all of our all the numbers in our IP together, and then it's gonna end at whatever the last number of <laughs> the remote connections IP is plus ours. Because remember you can't you can't be like uh, give me the uh, 50th thing and give me like from 10, like this is not going to work. You have to have start at one and then end at something further up than where you started. So we're taking our IP sum and adding that. So let's do that by simply doing IP sum two here. And now we're going to reverse it just because we're being extra clever here. Okay. So now that is the important thing that the challenge decoder is going to have to find and stuff into there because that's what we're using to salt this password with. And now this timestamp, we actually do want to use a timestamp inside of this password hash because like the salt, it's an extra layer of things that the attacker would have to have in order to, to uh, work with this. You know, he doesn't necessarily know that we're using a timestamp here if we don't tell him specifically that we're using a timestamp here. So let's, let's make this a little bit more, uh, uh, hidden. So we're going to just, this is the timestamp in as a date, a date time object. 
and we can now grab the timestamp from that and we'll stuff that in here. So it's basically doing the same thing on this end. But the important thing is now we're returning a date time object instead of a, a timestamp, which is going to look way, way different uh, when we get into uh, the, the actual communication back and forth. Um, so let's now make the decoder decode all this correctly. So the timestamp now is going to actually be a uh, I'll leave that as is, um, but we need to find the salt. And now the salt, we know the IP sum, and now we need to figure out the IP sum two here. Let me put salt here. So we do basically the same exact thing here where we're now going to take uh, the IP sum that we have and add whatever the last number of our IP is. So my IP split on the period and the last one of that and making sure that we change this into an int so that we can add these two numbers together. And we need to remember also that we're looking for that chunk backwards. Um, and now the timestamp is going to come through um, very, very weirdly. Uh, let me show you why this suddenly starts breaking. Uh, this is going to be extremely informative and a good like intermediate Python tip here. So, if we come down to our welcome here where we're sending this, uh, we shouldn't have to change anything here because we're, we're getting the timestamp and the challenge and everything like that. So let's let's see what happens. I know it's going to be bad, uh, but uh, it's going to be informatively bad. So right here, it's going to hit an exception when it tries to send this object of type date time. Because remember, all of our messaging back and forth is going is being JSON serialized and deserialized, uh, but it doesn't know what to do with date time. And that might seem odd to you because like that's a that's a built in Python thing. Like obviously people are going to be using this thing all the time. Why wouldn't this the JSON thing inside of <laughs> Python automatically convert this for me? And the reason for that is there's a lot of different ways that you might want to deserialize or reserialize or serialize or, or, or deal with that. There's a lot of ways to do that. And it's trying to provide you now the opportunity to choose how you want to do that. And in this specific case, we're going to choose to be super lazy about this. So uh, when we come up to where we're, we're doing this dump that, that created this problem, we can add a default so that if it ever encounters something it doesn't know what to do with, we tell it what to do with it. Um, so if we wanted to, we could make our own like super complex function that looks at it and says, okay, this is a daytime, do this very specific thing. Or we can just tell it to use the string uh, function, which is the same as like saying, uh, you know, this, if we do string on this, it just turns that integer into a string. And in this case, it's going to turn, um, if we do a string on the uh, date time object, it gives us this. So just by setting this, we've now uh, completely solved this problem, but we're going to need to re-serialize that because now we're going to get this date thing. So let's go through and while I'm thinking about it, let's make our... Um, change this now to say date so it's not obviously the timestamp anymore and in our login we need to be looking for that date so here is where we're uh, sending this off to be decoded and now we need to take that date string that we get and convert that into a date time object so that we can do the the dot timestamp from that so uh, we will just uh, write over timestamp and say that it is going to be equal to date time, uh, date time string p time. So this is the string from time and there's string p time. We want this. This is when you turn a string into time. The other ones when you turn time into a string. Uh, so in this case, we give it the date string, which is going to be this timestamp that uh, we're passing into this. And now we need to tell it what this format is. And it's usually very helpful to like comment and then paste 
whatever it is that you're trying to convert right above it uh, so you can figure this out. And I happen to know this because I do this way too goddamn often. Uh, so I'm able to remember that, okay, year is this and month is that and hour is this and minute is this and second is this and um, the microsecond is that. But if you're ever wondering what any of this is, go to uh, that website, stringftime.org, and it'll tell you exactly how to format any of these things. So this should work correctly. And now we're going to have a date time object on the other end of this, which we can now do a timestamp from that. But now that we've got this, this time object that we can work with, we can do Pythony things with it. Like we can make sure that this is actually a recent timestamp and then we're not getting some old one that uh, this, uh, some attacker is, you know, pulled up from the past to try to attack us with. Let's make sure this is recent. So let's uh, say that when was date time, date time, UTC now minus a time delta. And a time delta is just any difference in time of um, seconds 30. So we're saying, what is the time now minus 30 seconds? And say that uh, just in case their clock is running fast or something like that, uh, we'll do the, the reverse here, a date time, time delta uh, plus 30 seconds. So if when is less than timestamp and less than then, then we want to actually check the password hash. Uh, otherwise, we want to say that, uh, you know, this uh, suspicious uh, timestamp from this host and return false. Don't even bother screwing around with this guy. So uh, let me walk through that. I don't remember if I've shown you this before. You can do these uh, comparisons where you stick the thing that you're comparing in the center and then say, okay, is it less than this? And is it less than that? Or is it greater than this? Whatever you, you know. uh, so when is 30 seconds ago, that should definitely be less than this, which is less than 30 seconds of the future. And so there's a 30 second window where this timestamp that we're getting from the remote machine should fall into. And if it is, then we've got something good and we're, we're going to try to work with that. So, uh, Let's see if all of this is working. I didn't break anything uh, before we move on to step two. That feels like it broke. Yep, that definitely broke somewhere. Ah, oh, I screwed up the formatting. All right, that took me way too long to figure out. I got ahead of myself. I forgot the percent here. All right, let's try this again. I was busy bragging about how great I was at uh, uh, doing that. All right, we've connected. Is this actually connected? Are they sending statuses to each other? Updating status. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. So everything's working. So another vulnerability that we have is that we're sending the passwords in plain text. And that is terrible. Like even when you're on your own private network, this is not a good idea. I don't care how secure you think you are inside of your network. It, this is a bad idea, especially if you're on Wi-Fi. Like all bets are off if you're on Wi-Fi. So we need to be figuring out some way of encrypting this and sending it to the other machine, in this case, the server. But the server doesn't trust us yet until we give it the passwords. We're still stuck in this not quite fully trusted environment where only the client can trust the server because the server sent a challenge that the client was able to successfully decode. So the, the client knows that the server can be trusted, but the server still another client can be trusted until it gets this password from it. So the best way to solve this problem is with an encryption uh, called RSA, which is based on a public and private key where I can give you my public key. And I, in fact, I post my public key all over the internet. It doesn't matter. And now the only thing you do with that public key is encrypt messages to me. And the only person that can unencrypt that is a person with my private key. So, this, this is a great way to, to deal with these untrustworthy situations. So there are a lot of different packages on Python that'll do RSA for us. We're going to need to pip install the RSA one, just RSA, because it is going to make life so much easier than all the other ones out there. Uh, so uh, there's going to be just 
a weird kind of uh, sweet and sour mix that's going on here because this is still going to be a pain in the ass, but it's going to be so much less of a pain in the ass than with any other sort of thing because we don't have to worry about any of the math. So remember, if you're doing the math, you're doing it wrong. Let the mathematicians do the math when it comes to cryptography stuff. So um, back in our welcome, when we're sending the host name and the challenge and the API key uh, and all this nonsense, we should send a public key to the, the client, so the client can then use that public key to encrypt his password and send it to us. Because at this point, the client knows it can trust us if it can figure out this challenge. So it's going to be okay with giving us uh, the password. It just needs to do so in a secure way. So let's generate a public key and a private key using RSA new keys. And here we got to tell it how big of a bit key we want. And in this case, we're going to do a 512 bit key and we can now pass that here uh, give it the public key and um, this is one of the first hurdles we're going to have this public key that it gets right here isn't actually a number or, or a string or anything like that it's a class unto itself and it's got all kinds of different class operations and stuff we want to specifically get the just the key part. And the way to do that is to save the PKS1, um, which is a PEM file, if you have any familiarity with, with uh, SSL stuff. Um, we, we just wanna save that and we'll decode that to just be a, a string. And we're now gonna have this public key to use when we go back up here to login to encrypt the message. So we're going to uh, do an encrypted password is going to be equal to um, the RSA encrypt. And the message we want to encrypt now is this password here, uh, which we need to encode as a bytes object. And it wants the public key now. When you do the RSA public key, we're using the public key class because we're going to basically be re rebuilding that class here. Um, and we're going to load the PKCS1 file here, which is going to be our challenge uh, public key. And I don't remember if we have to encode or decode this. I think we have to encode it because we had to decode it. Um, and this will be the encrypted password, uh, which, oh God, there's, there's so many encoding and decoding things that we got to do here. Uh, Okay, we, we definitely have to decode that. Um, let's test this because I'm I'm really worried I'm gonna screw this up on the video. Uh, <laughs> you got to do all kinds of different like uh, encoding and decoding. So I'm gonna show you what's different when we do the encode and the decode here. And uh, let's see what we get on the other end. What do we get inside of this password password? And what does it look like when we encode that password password I don't think I'm gonna hit any errors and I should like hit a mismatch and maybe something else but there shouldn't be any exceptions okay there's an exception god damn it all right so I knew this, this is gonna be a pain in the ass it just always is uh, it's saying that you can't take our big encrypted password thing which did it print? Yeah. It can't turn this, which is a bytes object. That's what the B at the front of this means. It can't turn that into a UTF-8 encoded string. Uh, UTF-8 is what most of the Western world uses in to, to encode string data is. So it can't do that because this is a weird byte in, at this position. It doesn't know what the hell to do with this byte. It doesn't fit in the English language or any other language it knows of. So <laughs> what we need to do is actually use that base 64 stuff that we've been screwing around with in the past. Um, so like we've, we've been faking base 64, we're actually gonna use base 64 now, which is uh, built in, I'm pretty sure to Python. So we just import base 64 here. Um, so now I'll come down to where we're sending this. This is the encrypted password and right here, uh, we want to, instead of decoding that, we want to take base64 and b64 encode that. 
and I don't even know how to really explain what that is, this is doing other than to say that you know, like we're, we're used to a base 10 number system. This is converting it to basically a base 64 system. And so instead of this XF14 that it was choking on, it's going to be a number that it can deal with. Um, <laughs> Like, that's all we're doing. We're, we're, we're taking it like this is garbage right here. We're turning it into garbage that can be encoded into a string. Um, so we're going to decode that result into a string. So that when that get passed, gets passed over here, we're going to get something else. Uh, so now let me show you. Um, I'll show you what this looks like. Um, I'll put a... Uh, divider here so we can see that and on the other end we need to decode now that so this will be um, base 64 b64 decode don't use the decode and encode those are for files so we just use b64 decode and in this case this could be the password uh, password and we are going to have to re-encode this because we turned it into a string to turn it into JSON to turn it back into a byte to decode it here and that should work we should basically have the same thing on both ends hopefully now let's see what happens and no more exceptions all right so yeah it got that and it figured it out so we're just getting a password mismatch that's fine because right now we're, we're not actually doing a very good password comparison. So we've got the base 64 version of this password that we've encrypted coming across through the JSON. Now we can, uh, I interrupted that, so that screwed it up. But uh, yeah, um, so now we can use this decrypted or not quite decrypted we can use that base 64 thing to decrypt the password. So decrypted password is going to be uh, RSA. In this case, we're going to decrypt. And it, the first thing it wants is the crypto. So the thing that is crypto cryptographied. Uh, base 64, B64 decode, password, password. I'm going to encode that because it is a string coming from the JSON. And now here we use our private key that we generated up here. Remember, only this private key can unencrypt this. Um, this should start to work now. Another thing you got to remember is that the, the decrypted password here is going to be a bytes object, so you need to decode this. Um, God, I hope I'm not screwing something up. <laughs> There's so many encodes and decodes. I'm, I'm seriously like losing my mind with this. Connected that that's good. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. Oh god, they're actually even sending data back and forth. Okay, perfect. So we've done it. We've sent our password instead of saying which is in this case it's lol. Um gets turned into this crazy thing, which looks like this, and it, it's able to be decrypted and compared against what we're saving in our app settings, and we're able to say that. Without a doubt, this guy has the right password and we've exchanged passwords now securely. So what about everything else that we're doing? Because we're doing all these status messages now. They're open in, in the clear and plain text. So we probably want to start encrypting these because like there could be sensitive information in this. Like maybe I don't want anybody else that's peeking on my network to know what files I've got and, and you know, their cache hashes and all this other stuff. Um, like there's a lot of potentially sensitive information in this. We should be encrypting this too. And now you're probably thinking, well, okay, we figured out how to do that. We would just use this RSA thing now and we'll, we'll RSA the hell out of all of this. And unfortunately, that's not going to work. And this is the reason why that is. So remember that we're using this 512-bit key. That, that's really important. That means that in this little public key for this small, I'm sorry, I emphasize that 512 bits is small in this case, um, this small public key can only encrypt so much of a message before it runs out of math. Um, and in this case, it needs four, uh, yeah, 4,000 bytes, and there's only space for 53 bytes. 
in this small key. Uh, so you are thinking, okay, well, let's just make a bigger key. Uh, well, uh, so th this is a, an example of uh, one of these status messages. I just filled it up with garbage that to, to, a, a reasonably large size to, to show off the, the problem here. Um, so, okay, let's just make a larger key. But it, unfortunately, it takes a really, really long time to make large keys. So these 512-bit, my supercomputer here did that in... Uh, 118 milliseconds and we make that twice that size at a, a 1024 bit it does that at 175 milliseconds we make that even bigger now at uh, 2048 bit it takes uh two seconds or nearly three seconds but when we double from there it jumps all the, all the way up to eight minutes and the reason for that is this rsa thing is doing things with prime numbers just awful scary math things and it's got to find really 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 big prime numbers in order to generate these 4096 bits keys so even at that size though so even if we said that okay well i guess our program is just gonna sit here doing nothing for eight minutes <laughs> um i want to emphasize this is a very nicely spec pc that's doing this the number crunching on this right now so on a like a netbook or some poor laptop it's gonna burn down trying to come up with this uh before your app can actually do anything because it's gonna be locked trying to build this crazy big uh uh, high bit RSA key, it's still not going to be big enough. Like, it doesn't matter how big you make this RSA key. It, you're still going to keep running into problems. Like I, I think I, I did the math. It was like, you could only get like 500 bytes in one of these huge eight minute long crunches. So we're still, you know, 3,500 bytes shy of our goal. So we, we absolutely cannot use RSA for anything particularly large, but we didn't waste our time because now we've established a secure way of, of um, sending our password, and we can now use that secure way of sending our password to use as a secure way of sending a much easier encryption key. So we're gonna switch gears now. We're, we're moving from RSA to a, um, which is symmetrical, asymmetrical. We're moving from RSA to AES, which is a different type of encryption. And for this, we're going to need the cryptography thing. And I promise you, like, I know this sounds weird. I'm like, oh, but we just spent all this time on RSA. What, what the hell do you mean? We're going to get this cryptography um, uh, package. You got to pip install this. But like, this is the right way to do this. Okay. I know this sounds insane, but this is the right way to do this. Okay. So from the cryptography package, we're going to want Fernet. And we're going to import the class Fernet from that. And this, uh, while I'm thinking about it, we're going to need to declare in the, at the top of our um, connection class here that we're going to have an F thing. Because for some damn reason, that's the way everybody declares their Fernet classes. All right, so back down into where our, our welcome message is working out. And we're saying that all the challenging and stuff. We've figured out, okay, the passwords are matching. We're authorized. Let's generate an AES key and switch all of our encryption over to AES now. So our AES key is going to be um, Fernet um, generate key. And this is going to be much, much smaller. It's going to be like an instantaneous sort of thing where we get this instant AES key thing here. And now we need to pass this AES key to our um, client. And once again, we're going to now encrypt this like this is this is why we need to do all this RSA stuff, not just for the password. Now we're going to be transferring really sensitive information. This AES key, we're going to transfer this using the same RSA encryption because we have we should have the private and the public key for both of us. Let's make sure that I actually sent the public key along. I did not. OK, yeah, let's because we, we generated this public key. We just didn't pass it here. So let's public key. Uh, Oh, we didn't generate a public key for this guy yet. Let's do it right now. Public key, private key equals uh, RSA, new keys. All right. And then once again, we're going to have to do the base 64 shuffle here. Did we have to do that with the keys? I'm seriously like <laughs> it's it's really, really hard to be on video trying to describe all this stuff and keeping track of all the encodes, especially when we have to go into base 64 encoding. Let me just cheat here and check. So yeah, we, we just, okay, we just decode the public key. We didn't have to do any of the base 64 on that. All right. So our uh, public key, save PKCS1, ah! decode that to a string. 
Oh yeah, and we have to tell it this is gonna be a 512 bit key. Um, all right. So now we can use that public key that is being passed to us to encrypt the AES key to send that back now to the client. And then we can switch everything over to AES and it, I swear to Christ, man, as soon as we get that going, everything's gonna be gold. Like it's gonna be so much faster than all this other stuff we're doing. So the key now is gonna be RSA encrypt the AES key, which is fortunately already gonna be a bytes object. So we don't have to do, yeah. We don't have to do any encoding or anything like that on that. But now we're gonna have to do the uh, RSA public key load PKCS of uh, password pub public key encode. And then we have to base 64 that. I remembered. All right, uh, let's try to make that a little prettier. All right, that looks right. So now back here in the client, when it gets the confirmed, now it needs to, to grab the encrypted key. Uh, so we'll say the AES encrypted is, or actually it's just decrypted all in one string. Uh, RSA decrypt. The uh, what do we call this? The confirmation confirmation key, which was itself base sixty four encoded. So we got to base sixty four decode that key, uh, which means we're gonna have to encode that now as an, a bytes object. Did I remember to decode that? Encode. Ah, oh, fuck! I forgot that. We have to decode that. And, uh, okay, so we're encoding that now back into a bytes object, back into a base64 object, which, or from a base64 object. I think that's right, okay. And we're gonna use our private key to do the decryption, and this should give us an AES key. Uh, let's, print this out uh, yeah this is gonna be a bytes object <laughs> let's make sure that these two are, are using the right key here we'll print out the AES keys let me get rid of all the other print messages all right that looks right. And that looks like the same thing, except it's a bytes thing and the other one isn't. So that's that's fine, we can deal with that. Um, so <clears throat> now that we've got the AES key from the server, remember that uh, F that we made at the top of our class here? We're going to use that to assign a class instance of Fernet using this AES key. Um, I, I know this sounds so confusing. I swear it's going to be so easy once we get going. Like once once this is done, the, all the other encryption stuff is going to seem so trivial and easy and, and wonderful. So, all right, here's the, where it sends that. And we're, we decrypted it. We got it here. Set self F to Fernet, and this wants the key. So we're going to give it the K, uh, which we shouldn't have to decode because it should want that as a bytes object. Yes, okay. And now, like that's the, that's really all we have to do is make this little F. This tiny little F is now gonna solve so many problems for us because we can go up into where our, our whole messaging system is. You know, we, we've had to do all this crazy convoluted bullshit with, uh, you know, encoding and decoding, all this other stuff. We don't have to do any more of that ever again. Because uh, up here in our send message, we can just make this a, a, a normal part of our sending and receiving process. So if self.f is not none, 
then we've got a working Fernet thing that we can use to encrypt and decrypt stuff with. So let's let's do that. Data is now equal to self f encrypt this data, uh, which I need to encode as a bytes object. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Like that's that's all we got to do. And this WebSocket is going to send that data uh, as this encrypted information. And on the other end of this, where we receive this message now, we need to make sure that okay, if self.f is not none, then we're we know that the sender is going to be sending a uh, uh, encrypted message. We should probably decrypt that. So message is equal to self f decrypt the message. Um, I uh, want to encode. Our, actually, we won't need to encode that. That should come through as a bytes object. So, uh, and that's it. Like from now on, all of our sending and receiving will always be encrypted for us, as long as we're using our send and receive function. And while I'm thinking about it, in our listener function, we need to do the same thing because we're only going to ever hit the listener function after we've established this handshake. So here where we async for message in WebSocket, we just do the same thing, message equals self f decrypt the message. That's it. Like it, it, we didn't have to do any of the crazy bullshit that we've been doing for the last 30 minutes or so. The messages are just gonna come through decrypted. In fact, you're not gonna believe this because it's gonna, it's gonna be so easy and uh, I'm gonna print the, the encrypted message just so you could see that it is going to be encrypted. And if we see these statuses, the status messages on each other, then we know that they are going to be loading it correctly as JSON and it's looking at the op type and it's looking at that successfully and getting status from that op type. So if if we see the status and we see this, we know that everything is working perfectly. Uh, let me um, make sure now to, because this the self equals F is an important thing for our send function, we wanna make sure that we only set this on both after we're ready for that full back and forth communication over AES. So here we need to wait until after we've sent the key with the RSA encryption. Now we can do the self F on the um, uh, server here. And that's it. This should work. I'm feeling really optimistic. Like I, I'm telling you, the, the, all the AES stuff is so much easier. Um, New connection from client. It's oh god, it worked. Okay, it's connected. It hasn't thrown up any errors. Let's see if it gets the status. Yes. Okay. So here's that status message as an encrypted AES encrypted thing, and it successfully decrypted, it, stuffed it into a JSON or yeah, basically loaded it as JSON, and then was able to turn that into Python, <laughs> where it's able to look for that op status thing or op type of status, and then knew to print that stat, uh, status report. So it's, it's sending these encrypted messages now automatically. And I know it's been a really, really long journey, but what we have just created here is basically the way your web browser works, uh, where you're, you're used to SSL with these uh, certificates and things like that, but it's not encrypting everything using the SSL per se. It's using AES at about 128 bit to do all the, the bulk messaging. It's just using the RSA to send that AES key. So we've just recreated SSL in a highly customized way that I hope has been extremely informative because what we've got here now is like really, really serious security. And we didn't have to do any math. And uh, <laughs> it's it's going to be like, what we've got right now is basically HIPAA compliant. Like I, you would have to change these new keys here if you, if you care about uh, HIPAA compliance. Uh, you'd have to pump these up to two, uh, 1024, but that's it. Like as long as both of these RSA keys are 1024, the AES that Fernet is using is uh, uh, HIPAA compliant. Like it, it won't be necessarily like a Department of Defense, but like if you've got super sensitive medical records, this is actually <laughs> compliant with that uh, uh, medical record requirement uh, privacy stuff. So, um, I hope that this has been something you can follow and, and really learn from because when you see how much goes into creating these secure things, it gives you a better appreciation for how much you've got to be taking this stuff seriously. You know, you'd have fun with it, but leave the serious stuff to the serious math people. Uh, God, 
I really hope you've been able to follow this. I'm going to stop now because I'm a horse. Uh, thank you very much to all my patrons. I'm up to three patrons now. Thank you very much, guys. Take it easy, folks. Thank you.